Hello, and welcome to Finding Home Memoirs, a program in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Jane Kulo, Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. A couple of notes before I hand the program over to our speakers. Please share your questions using the Q&A tab on Zoom. This event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize using the closed captions tab at the bottom of your window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from our bookseller for this event, UVA Bookstore, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore our full, our full schedule and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Thank you to our sponsor, the Charlottesville Sister Cities Commission and Sister City Winneba, Ghana, for their support of this program. And thanks to our community partners for sharing information about this event, the Carter G. Woodson Institute at UVA and the Maxine Platzer Lynn Women's Center at UVA. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Louis Chude Soke, author of Floating in a Most Peculiar Way, is the editor in chief for The Black Scholar and director of the African American Studies Program at Boston University. His writing and scholarship on the literatures and cultures of African diaspora have been recognized internationally. Nadja Awusu, author of Aftershocks, is a Brooklyn based writer and urban planner. She's the recipient of a 2019 Whiting Award. Her lyric essay, So Devilish a Fire, won the Atlas Review Chapbook Contest, and her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Lily, Literary Review, and Electric Literature. And our moderator, Kwame Edwin Otu, is an assistant professor of African American and African Studies at the Carter G. Woodson Institute of African American and African Studies at UVA. His forthcoming book is Amphibious Subjects, The Contested Politics of Queer Self-Making in Neoliberal Ghana. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Kwame, over to you. Thank you so very much, Jane, for this wonderful introduction. And it's such a delight to finally put faces on um, Nadia and Louise. Um, welcome to the University of Virginia. Welcome to Charlottesville, Nadia. Welcome to Charlottesville, Louise. I'm truly honored to be having this conversation, or at least to be put in conversation with you. And, and I'm interested in the fact that, or uh, invested in the fact that we are actually on a panel called Finding Home. Home is really critical for, um, for everybody, but especially for, for Black people and Africans in the diaspora, the very idea of home has always been there, it's been present. And I like the fact that in your work, both of you approach home in a very interesting way, not in the fashion that somehow has become so all too familiar, this understanding of home as, you know, an immovable, right, you know, domain home as a linear, a place we go to, a place we always return to. But in a way, I like the kind of um, the multi-linear multi, multi right, dimensions you afford home. I'm particularly interested in your titles. For me, one thing I really took from the title is the fact it is, you know, Nadia is talking about aftershocks, right? So then when I think about aftershocks, I'm thinking about earth, land. I'm, th I'm thinking about the terrestrial habitat. Louise is talking about floating, right? I'm thinking about water. I'm thinking about air, right? I, I'm interested in really getting to why these particular metaphors, how do they allow you in your journey or how do they allow you to make sense of navigating home or this desire to find home? Aftershocks, which is a terrestrial analytic, and floating, which could be aquatic or arboreal. I'm really just interested in that. Mm -hmm. Nadia, would you like to, or should? Sure. <laughs> um, thanks for that question. It's really nice to be here with you both. Um, yeah, so in terms of the, your, the metaphor um, and the title, Aftershocks, so 
um, a little bit about my story just to give people some background. Um, my mother left when I was two and my sister and I were raised by our Ghanaian father who was the great hero of my life. Um, and he worked for a UN agency. So we moved to a different country every couple of years. And so the notion of home was always very complicated for me. Um, and when I was seven and we were living in Italy, after a long absence, my mother showed up at our house on the same day that I learned about a catastrophic earthquake that destroyed the city of Spitak in Armenia. And my mother is actually Armenian American, um, but you know she was not much in my life. But I remember my father always listened to the BBC World Service. Um, and so I remember the, the um, announcer on the radio talking about the possibility of aftershocks. And that was the first time that I had heard of, of the word. And so I asked my father what aftershocks are. And he said that they are the Earth's delayed reaction to stress. And then that same day, my mother, who I hadn't seen since I was four, I was seven at this time, and my mother showed up at our house in Italy. She lived in the United States. She had remarried and she had two daughters. Um, and, you know, she was, she was not much in my life. We, we spoke on the phone sometimes. She wrote letters. But all of that is to say that my mother's arrival on the same day as an earthquake in, in Armenia, where her roots are, sort of got conflated in me and sort of created this metaphor in some ways that I lived inside of um, without being very aware of it until I started writing this book. And actually, I, um, I started writing the book sort of just for myself as a private project. And, and it wasn't until I realized, OK, maybe I can make art out of this. And I sent it to a friend. And she actually pointed out to me that I was writing in seismic terms a lot and that I was referencing after, uh, earthquakes. And I hadn't really noticed it because it was so natural to me because the earthquakes have been sort of a guiding metaphor for my life. And in some ways, her telling me that sort of helped me to see the ways in which, you know, your notion of home, the, the notion that you raised of home not being linear, um, that using the metaphor of an earthquake, particularly because I already had that sort of private shaking in my own body, made sense because an earthquake, the story of an earthquake is not linear and it's not easily understood in, except in retrospect, you know? So what we thought was the earthquake actually is the foreshock and then you have to reshuffle the story. And because my life was so hopscotched, I was living in a different country every couple of years. My father is Ghanaian, my mother was Armenian American. My life was not linear either. And so I felt that that was really fitting and it gave me a way to kind of lean into my story and and move towards understanding the story right. um, in retrospect um, through that metaphor. Thank you so very much, Nadia. That was great. Who is? Uh, yeah, it's um, wonderful to be here, um, not just at the festival, but on this panel with uh, folks who my instincts tell me relate very much to the kind of uh, <laughs> vision and sensibilities that I'm trying to express. Thank you for the backstory, um, Nadia. I want to add to that with some of my own. Um, my mother was a Jamaican woman who migrated to London as a part of the very famous generation of West Indian immigrants called the Windrush generation, the ones who sort of created multicultural England as we know it today. But my mother went there as a nurse after World War II, and my father was there. He's um, from Nigeria. He was a military man who was going to the prestigious Sandhurst Military Institution. He was one of those Africans that were picked to take over after the British <laughs> um, left. So he was being trained along with my godfather and a whole cohort of West Africans to become those who took over after the British left. Of course, Jamaicans and Nigerians were not supposed to have anything to do with each other. And they happen to fall in love. And six weeks later, she's in Nigeria. <laughs> um, my father was a very, very much a part of the secession that led to the Nigerian Civil War, the Biafra War. And so my title has a lot to do with this um, history of the Biafra War, because after my father died, we became refugees at the end of the Biafra War when Biafra collapsed. And we were refugees smuggled out to Gabon. And according to family legend, the song that allowed me to sleep easier when I was a refugee child in Gabon was David Bowie's Space Oddity, <laughs> which features the, the line, floating in a most peculiar way. 
I don't know how true that is, but that legend stayed with me throughout my life. And as I migrated to Jamaica and then to the United States, I found myself always obsessed with that song to find out if it was true. And then I found myself really listening to other songs by this weird voice and this weird person that was then attached to science fiction, which was my childhood obsession, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so although it was never able to be verified, my family always said, and my mother always said, yes, we sang that song to you as a child. And I know that when I came to the United States, when I first discovered, oh, that song is written by a person named David Bowie, my life radically, radically changed because back to the guiding metaphors that Nadia brought up, floating made sense to me. It always made sense to me. Home for me, turns out, is the process of navigation. It's not a place. <laughs> it's navigation itself. It's um, an experience of never landing because there's never a place that you can affix yourself to. The only things that made sense to me in my childhood, moving from Gabon, Nigeria, Jamaica, um, the United States, and in between and around multiple communities, the only thing that was secure for me was music and science fiction. <laughs> and so much of that is how the book is told, is narrated, my relationship to music and science fiction as we migrated all around the world, much like Nadia and her family. Thank you so very much. I'm also particularly interested in women, present the women in your lives, right? That your aunts, like I'm thinking about, you know, Nadia's aunts and stepmother. I'm thinking about your aunt Harriet and is it um, a bigger aunt, you know, yeah. in Jamaica? And, and the fact that the, the presentation of black women in the narrative, right, is just quiet you know, it, it's unconventional, unconventional in a way that, you know, um, strips from them in a positive way. This, you know, uh, you know, that black women have agency in, in this text, that they are there, they are playing so many roles that we do not see. So was this, was this your intention to perhaps jettison, you know, whatever singular narrative we have about black women, right? Was it part of the, of the desire to portray this kind of, you know, representation, was it was it ever intentional? Nadia, or should I go ahead? <laughs> oh, okay, um, I'll say this: um, it's unintentional and intentional. Um, it starts out as unintentional simply because, forgive the essentialist statement. We're Africans, right? And our worlds are overwhelmed with women, mm -hmm. right? Aunties, as I say in the book, aunties upon aunties upon aunties. And one of the things that holds the world together for me in the memoir is wherever we travel and migrate, there's a bunch of new aunties, <laughs> some related by blood, some by friendship, some by just extended family, kinship networks. And so aunties are just everywhere. And I went out of my way to make sure that they kind of blurred into each other, mm. that no matter where you go, there are these aunties, whether they're Afro-Caribbean or Nigerian or African-American or from Nevis or from different islands. Because to a child, it's just everywhere you go, there's aunties. But as a writer and someone aware of how black women are represented, I wanna make it clear that African women are not only always have agency, they always are very much the, they set the template for how culture is maintained. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in the sort of classic old school feminist way that women are the home. I don't mean that at all. They're also the market. They're also self-defense. They're also who beat people up for me when I was a kid, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, so that was very important for me, but it was also crucial for me to tell the story of a young boy who does not understand that. He spends his life looking for uncles and men. Mm -hmm. And so he's believing that there's something missing, but the narrative is telling him constantly, there is nothing missing. Right, right, right. right. Thank you. Yeah, Lewis, that resonates with me so much because um, for much of my life, the story that I felt kind of defined a lot of my life, and this is in part because of 
stories that I internalized from reactions from, from other people when I said that my mother left or when they found out that, you know, I was being raised by a single father. And then when my father remarried that I had a stepmother, but, um, but the story was, was one of abandonment and that I didn't have a mother, but that wasn't actually my experience. When I went back to sort of reflect on my life, I had a council of mothers, you know, all of the aunties in my life. My auntie Harriet, who mothered me, you know, took me into her home, um, raised my sister and me um, along with her daughter, Laura. She was a single mother. Um, she lived in, in the UK and sort of kindred to your family, uh, Lewis, and that she was also a nurse. Um, and um, she, she raised my sister and me like we were her own daughters until my father was ready to sort of take on this job of raising two girls um, on his own and then with my stepmother. And so looking back on my story and telling my story in my own terms, as opposed to sort of the stories I've been given, I realized that no, actually that's wrong. I had many mothers. I wasn't motherless. I had many mothers. I had my aunt Harriet, my auntie Violet, my auntie Frida, all of the aunties who were not related to me, the aunties who maybe were related to me, but I don't know how, my grandmothers, you know, all of those women raised me and were such forces of, you know, strength and creativity and love. And, you know, that really surrounded me. And I had a lot of role models to look up to and to, to see sort of who I could be as a black woman as well. And, and I would also say, you know, my father mothered me too. Um, you know, I think that men can also be mother, mothering, you know, if you think about it as a verb. And so, you know, I was able to then reject that narrative that I was given of, of being sort of motherless um, or even the, the notion that families like mine are broken families, you know, which is the story that we're often told. My family isn't broken, it's expansive. You know, when, when my mother left and my father died when I was 13, um, my extended family stepped in and offered homes to me and my sister. And, you know, that's, that's a story that, um, that, is more important than, than sort of the story of abandonment that's a part of who I am, but it's certainly not all of who I am. I do love one thing about this kind of cultural context, and that is basically losing track of who's related by blood or not. <laughs> <laughs> At a certain point, you just stop asking, you know? <laughs> but one thing that's all I wanted to add is the story of mothers and mothering in the memoir is not always a good one. Um, there's discipline, there is pain, there is trauma, there is violence, there is confusion. But as a young person, as a young boy becoming a man, because this is sort of gendered in that way, um, it's also a story about someone who just doesn't understand what women are going through to raise you across borders. Right. And so I do try to convey that even though there are things going on that the young boy doesn't understand or is resentful towards these women for, the problem is him not knowing, not so much the women not doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of transgression too, and I really appreciate Nadia, you bringing up your, your father mother in you because we don't usually get that kind of portrayal, right? And so seeing your father who is also atheist if I'm right so I think this takes me to my next question on religion because it looks as if you know b both of you are coming from very divergent perspectives when it comes to religion so then how does that play a role in this quest that you're pursuing to find home in this kind of tussle back and forth this tightrope you're walking yeah. Um, yeah. So my father was an atheist. I mean, he was raised an altar boy um, in the Anglican church, as many Ghanaians are. Um, but he, you know, as he grew up, sort of decided that he wanted different kinds of stories. And he would always talk to me about, you know, he felt like th those stories were too simple and that there was nothing wrong with sort of searching for the divine or searching for grace. And in fact, he even encouraged me to sort of make up my own mind. You know, I, I did my confirmation and went to Sunday school, even though he didn't believe um, and, you know, he would go to church when my grandmother forced him to, mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, he, and he very much emphasized, like, I want you to make up your own mind, but also 
I want you to have access to a lot of different belief systems. And so introduced me to sort of many faiths and told me stories from many faiths. But for him, you know, he, he said that he, it was enough for him to be marveling at the wonders of the universe, that that story was miraculous enough um, that he didn't need sort of a creator sort of meddling in it. Um, and then also, you know, my father had a very Pan-African worldview as well, which he very much raised me in. Um, and, you know, he just as he would, you know, often um, bristle when, for example, his American colleagues at the UN would say, oh, are you watching the American election? And my father would say, the Ghanaian election is going on. Are you watching that? Um, but in the same way with religion, you know, he, he would always sort of say we had our own gods before the white man arrived right. and our stories are, you know, morality tales in the same way. And so he would share those stories with me too, um, but emphasizing sort of like um, there's usefulness in those stories, just as there's usefulness in the stories in the Bible. And I'm not going to tell you what to think, but, you know, use what, use what makes sense to you from all of those stories. Mm -hmm which I think was very helpful, you know, for somebody who did grow up sort of on borders and boundaries and straddling cultures, mm -hmm. as I did, um, to be able to sort of embrace so many of the stories that were coming at me in and, and many of the homes that I lived in, in complicated ways, you know, I never had a very, I never had an uncomplicated sense of belonging, but I was able to sort of navigate many stories, many lands, many cultures, many languages. Thank you. In my case, despite being born in Biafra, right before it became swallowed up by Nigeria, we're Igbo people and Igbos are largely Catholic. <laughs> um, so I was christened Catholic, but the, the religious narrative, sorry, the, the narrative of religious tension in my memoirs because when my mother migrated to the United States, um, I had to be left behind in Jamaica and I was adopted by a Seventh-day Adventist family who were pretty strict. And I don't know how familiar people are with the Seventh-day Adventists. They're very, they're very strict. Uh, they can, in fact, be quite grim at times. And the family I grew up with was the kind of family that if you weren't in the church, you weren't to be socialized with. Mm -hmm. So our friends, our close friends had to be in the church. The people we did business with were in the church. The people we interacted with were in the church. So I had to be in the church. But because I was adopted temporarily until my mother sent for me, I was also not officially a member of the church. So I was this sort of token Sunday worshiper, which is one of the insults they use for people who are not Seventh-day Adventists. So it was also the legend in my, not the legend, the fact that my mother became a Seventh-day Adventist because it's one of the best colleges on the island at the time. Mm -hmm. And so she was always suspected as of being a false Seventh-day Adventist, and she only pretended to be one so that she could get into the college. Between you and me, that was probably true. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but it was never confirmed by her. And so there was always this tension around who's inside, who's not inside. Are you a member of the church? Are you not? Then we moved to the United States. And then my mother was basically a, whoever will take you to church while I'm working, you can go to church. And so religion for me became something I had to struggle with because of the Seventh-day Adventist experience, which was very fire and brimstone, very fundamentalist. Right. And so by the time I got to high school and college and began to explore, you know, Marxism or radical politics or black activism, etc., I was responding primarily to the God of Seventh-day Adventists. Right. Right. At this point, thank you so much. I would like to remind members of the audience to share questions if they have any for our very brilliant, intelligibly smart panelists. So please, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and ask the others. I'd like to also, um, I think I'm quite amazed at just how beautifully you have dismantled the, the binary. I mean, there's a, a kind of unsettling binaries in your, in your narratives. I'm really now thinking about just how you collapse the diaspora and the nation. And I see this particularly, you know, invoked in how just reading Nadia's or Louis, your work can somehow give me a sense of, you know, like the 
independence in African nations, and in Nadia's case in Ghana, that Ghana's independence was not just a local affair, that it was like an entire constellation. It involved so many movements. It was very Pan-African in character, but also you are also in your, in both narratives, you have a way of amplifying the, you know, internal squabbles right, that, you know, independence does not just come on a silver platter. So in Nadia's case, I'm thinking about the NLM versus the CPP of Ghana, and in Louise's case, you know, you know, Biafra itself and, and, in opposition to, you know, the post-colonial Nigerian state. So I really want to, I, it was just fascinating, I'm like, this is really quite historical. It is not just a memoir about you. It is also a kind of national memoir, but also it is a diasporic memoir, right? And I think that is really what stuck out to me that you, you are just really getting rich, stripping these binaries apart. How were you able to accomplish that? Thank you so much for that. Yeah, that was really important to me. Um, you know, I've always had this awareness that we carry history in our bodies and that we are history living and breathing. And, you know, I remember very vividly my father telling me about, you know, for example, how the trauma of the Armenian genocide was in my mother's family's DNA. And when he explained sort of why she left, that was part of the story that he told me. Um, and yeah, I, you know, my father's job at the UN meant that we moved to, we lived in other African countries. You know, my father as a, as a Ghanaian, we, we would move to Uganda, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and then he ultimately also married a Tanzanian. And so I had all of these African histories in my life. And my father was actually also very committed to ensuring that I studied that African history because when, even when we were living in Africa, because I went to international schools, I wasn't learning about Africa. I was learning about Europe and maybe a little bit of Asia. Um, and the one sort of story of Africa that was in my history, world history textbook was Egypt. And you know, the people who were depicted, you know, the ancient Egyptians were depicted as really European looking and my father was just infuriated. And so he created his own curriculum to sort of teach me um, about African history. And in particular, he focused on the independence movement, starting with the independence movement in Ghana, because he was, of course, as a Ghanaian, very proud of that role. But he also was very clear about the complexities of that story. Um, and especially because that story is so often told from a Western perspective, he really wanted me to understand, you know, that that to make a nation out of many tribes that has, is coming out of colonialism, the complexity of that and the ways in which interference made that project even more difficult, mm -hmm. you know, Western interference. And so it was always told to me as a really complicated story. And, you know, when we were living in Ethiopia, for example, the country was going through a civil war. And so there was history being made all around me. And my father made sure that I knew it because we were not studying that history in school. Yeah. Um, and again, he was infuriated by that. Um, but so he was very much engaged with sort of the history of Africa and, and particularly with a Pan-African sort of um, ideology. And that actually, you know, going back to your previous question about home, that, that sort of Pan-African idea of a connection across the diaspora between all Black peoples was something, you know, it gave me something sort of big and loving to believe in and to belong to, you know, and, and that was a really important sort of guiding force in my life as well. And so as I set out to write the book, which, you know, in many ways was a private project for me to sort of narrate myself closer to those histories that my father started to teach me, but then because I largely had a Western education and he died when I was 13, you know, I didn't get to then dive into um, as deeply as I think he would have liked. And so in some ways to honor him, I chose to really engage with that history as I was writing um, this book and to, and, and to narrate myself closer to those histories and to narrate myself closer, closer to him in some ways and to the lessons that he was trying to instill in me. So that was really important. And it also helped me to sort of contextualize my life and to understand um, sort of the forces that, that made my life possible. Right. Thank you so much for that thick uh, response. Thank you, Nadia. In many more ways, we share a lot in that regard, but it's also quite different for me in the sense that um, a lot of my book is about the failure of the Pan-African dream. Mm -hmm. The failure of it 
which doesn't mean the erasure of it that we should ignore it. The book begins with genocide. It begins with a Nigerian man being told by his family not to marry this Jamaican woman and the Jamaican woman being told that Africans are primitive and we should stay away from them. They marry anyway, which is a failure of, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the part of both families, it was seen as a failure. <laughs> She goes to Nigeria and within a few years, there's a genocide. And my father and my godfather of the parts of the, the leaders of the Biafra movement, they're thinking that, well, we're fighting for the black man, the rise of the black man. My mother remembers Ghana's independence. When she's um, almost near on her deathbed, she can sing Lord Kitchener's song, Birth of Ghana, <laughs> which she often did, right? But she is in the midst of the civil war in Nigeria hearing that this is the black man rising up against colonialism, but my mom says to them, well, aren't the people killing us black too? Aren't they the black man? <laughs> right? And that question of violence, internal, and its relationship to the external colonial and post-colonial violence runs all the way through the book. Mm -hmm. When we arrive in Jamaica as Africans, primarily in a moment where Ni Jamaicans have discovered African pride, the Africa that they've discovered is not genocide or civil war. Mm -hmm. And so they're conflicted about their relationship to us refugees. Right, right. And then the book migrates to the United States where we arrive in the United States as West Indian, West African immigrants amongst African Americans who don't know what to make of us at all. <laughs> right? So I do pay a lot of attention to the prejudices within the Pan-African dream because all of the family members even when they were prejudiced, believed in a Pan-African dream. Even if they were saying horrible things about Ghanaians or horrible things about African-Americans, mm -hmm. they still believed in a Pan-African dream, right? And that contradiction between dream and reality, prejudices and fantasy is really what runs through this book. Right, right. It's also very interesting, uh, Louise, because there, there's a lot of foreshocks, main shocks, and aftershocks in your book, too. And I think just what you've described as a genocide happening on the level of the country, you know, can't be detached from colonization itself and can't also be, de de um, you know, detached from slavery, for example. So then again, there are all these main shocks, aftershocks, and foreshocks that clearly, you know, um, rattle this linear kind of narrative narrative that we are also obsessed by. So I, um, I, there are a couple of questions in the Q, um, the Q section. I'm going to read them out. Nadia, there's a question for you, which goes as follows, and I quote, what does the picture on the dust jacket cover represent? Sure. Um, so if, if you look closely at it, you can see that the, the woman on the cover is wearing sort of a kente inspired um, dress off the shoulder and also has kind of kente cloth woven through her hair. And so that sort of represents, you know, my connection to Ghana, but then also the woman is sort of facing away and the book actually opens with my mother walking away um, and, and sort of this like moving both toward and moving away from, um, which I think is, is a big part of what the book's about. So I think that's what is represented there. Thank you so much. This, the, the second question is for all of you. Is in all your travels, did you come across people who had more of a sense of belonging, of home? More than we did or just, or I don't understand. Um, can I really get, I mean, I, the question just got deleted. Um, so I think maybe more than you did like did you come across people who actually had a stable sense of belonging i think that your question is is okay. there really such a thing as a home does someone have a, a wholesome sense of belonging is it possible to be complete right and i think i mean that's what something i've been thinking about there's a lot of incompleteness going on in the in the text so is that is there is it possible to be complete at this point though it's interesting I, that's why i wanted to actually get the question right because mm -hmm. an important one and again, I can't speak for Nadia, but one thing I already feel kin to Nadia with is that we're telling stories about people who might seem to be spread out and scattered, might seem to be fragmented and incomplete, 
but we're actually, forgive me Nadia for speaking on your behalf, we're actually quite comfortable. <laughs> and it, uh, we've become it, at least I feel that I've become it. And what I've discovered is the reason that one, is be one feels comfortable is because I believe that almost everyone actually feels homeless on some level. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure that completion or full residence is possible unless you are deeply deluded about your relationship to the world around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would completely agree with that. I think that, you know, it's interesting. Obviously, I didn't plan for my book to come out during a global pandemic. Um, but I think it coming out during a global pandemic, just the forces that are discussed in, in the book of sort of disconnection and dislocation and isolation and, you know, the sort of binaries that that many of us are kind of tried, uh, forced into in some ways. And going back to what Lewis was saying about sort of the failure of the Pan-African vision on the one hand and the hope of it on the other. You know, when my, when my Ghanaian father married my Tanzanian stepmother, it was a scandal. It was a whole scandal on both sides, you know? And so um, that's just, that's, I guess that is all to say that like those, I think that the resistance to those binaries and the, the acceptance of multiplicity and a, of dislocation and disconnection as a part of life, um, I think we're all feeling that so much right now. Um, but I but I agree with Lewis that in, I don't think I don't think that there are many people who have a very uh, perfectly defined and comfortable relationship to belonging and home. I think our lives might be sort of a more extreme example of what it can look like. But I think our, our lives in some ways provide an example of what it can mean to embrace that multiplicity and to embrace the complexity and to sort of accept that as, as a home in some ways. So in a, in a way you are echoing Louise's point of home as a process of becoming, that you know home is really a process rather than a state or a sedentary state of being. Absolutely. Keep another thing in mind, even in advance of the pandemic, Nadia, we have seen more displaced people on planet Earth in the last two generations than in history. Mm -hmm. People all over are displaced. And we're getting to a point right now where the number of those who are in the place where they are, quote unquote, from, are dwindling. <laughs> Right? So this kind of narratives of displacement and these questions that you're asking, Kwame, you know, they're increasingly universal, but some would say they probably always have been. Right, 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 right. And I think that leads me to the third question by Yvette. Nadia, I think this is for you. I'm curious about how, I'm curious about how you would want your readers read, to read your Beth Mother Amos. Is there more to the story that isn't revealed in the memoir? Do we forgive her? Do you want your readers to question the story your father told us? Is there a second book being written that explores the relationship with your mother and sisters? Um, so I, I'll take the, the, that last question first. I'm not currently writing another memoir. I'm, I'm currently working on a novel, but of course, of course there's more to the story. There's always more to everyone's story, you know, in a memoir, is not, not an autobiography. It's the story of a particular point in your life or exploring questions that you're carrying and themes. You know, it's not taking you sort of from the beginning to the end of a very esteemed life, you know? Um, and, and sort of that's the work of autobiography. But this book really is about sort of coming to terms with complexity, with the shaky earth, with the um, with, with loose roots that you can't quite grasp onto. Like that is the story of that book. And so if the question is like, is that what I hope that readers take away, that it's complicated, that the things are not tied in a bow at the end? Yes, that is a part of my story. And the story of my relationship with my mother is not over. It's an ongoing story, you know, and it, it will be an ongoing story as long as we're both alive and after that, you know, through the other people in our lives. And, you know, I can offer that part of the journey of writing this book was getting me to a place where I was ready to sort of reach out to her and, and to begin a process of reconciliation. And that's, that's a work in progress and it's a long process. And, you know, we're in each other's lives and we both, um, you know, we've had difficult conversations. We've had loving conversations and she's a big supporter of me telling this story, um, but her story is her own. So I'm, I'm not going to like give the answers as to sort of the reasons for her leaving, you know, that's, that's sort of her story. Um, or if she sort of, if I do decide that I want to write another book, perhaps, 
you know, I will, I will ask at that point if that's a story she'd be willing to have me tell, but yeah, it's, you know, my, my life doesn't end on the last page of the memoir. And so I'm still learning and growing and, and, and sort of moving into relationship with the people in my life. Thank you. Um, there's another question this time for the two of you. How do projects of finding home help us find our voices? How do projects of finding home help us find our voices? I think we've all agreed that home for us anyway, and possibly for an increasing number of people on planet Earth, mm -hmm. is a narrative and a process. It's not a place. Mm -hmm. Another way of putting it is, Finding home is finding a story. And to tell a story requires a voice. <laughs> right. Sorry to sound cryptic, but that's the formula that I would have. The project of finding home is to find that story that right. defines home for you and the process of finding home, which as Nadia has pointed out, is endless. It doesn't end on the last page, right? But in order to tell that, for example, the structure of my memoir and I think memoirs in general are, they allow you to shape the telling in ways that your own memory worked. Mm -hmm. And that, that is your voice, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or that is how you find your own voice and your own narrative. Mm -hmm. Largely, how do, how, do you, how do you remember? How did Nadia remember those things and in what order? And how did she choose to put it down in another order, right? right. Same thing with me. That is the finding of voice. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that that's so well put. And that that was sort of intentionally um, what Lewis just said. It was intentionally what my, my project was. You know, when I started this as a private project, um, it was an intentional process of taking the stories that I had been given, you know, whether by my father, which in many cases were sort of very loving stories, or by the world that in some cases were not so loving stories that maybe did me harm um, and, and sort of examining them with rigor and, and bringing sort of my own analysis to those stories and, and in some way sort of writing myself a story that I could live inside of because the ones that I had been given were not working for me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that, that to me is sort of why I wrote a memoir. You know, I was following my curiosities and my need to sort of create a new story that, that served me, that honored my family and the places and people um, that I belong to. And, and not in a simple way, you know, like in an honest way that sort of was willing to look at the difficult things, but that also sort of opened up possibilities um, for a way forward that, was, that I was choosing for myself. Right, right. Um, I want to quickly ask another question before the panel closes. So then you both contend in with race. I think it's a very critical dimension of, of the narratives and then of the memoirs. And, and I would really like to understand the ways in which you um, navigated, right? Telling a story, um, not only of interracial cleavages, but intraracial cleavages because you know of course in the US in particular where all three of us right are actually seen as immigrants if you will um you know we are not called expats right when white people travel to other parts of the world they are called expats and they are like they are in class positions all three of us are in they are called expats even if they are not they are called expats so I'm interested in particular in how you contend with narrating interracial and interracial cleavages that, you know, somehow animates your life? Um, I'll just, one thing I wanted to do, because I have an academic background and I'm a scholar and I've written academic books, I wanted to not operate within the academic frame, because to be quite frank, I don't believe that the academic frame, even the black critical racial frame allows us to get at the internal tensions and competitions and hostilities because we are expected to maintain a dominant narrative of solidarity at all times. Right. So we, we tend to then lie or exaggerate. I wanted to tell it in the context of memoir where we can be really intimate about the pain we cause each other mm -hmm. while at the same time maintaining anti-racist perspectives. 
right? I think it's really important to be able to tell those stories, but also to tell stories of multiple types of blackness that may or may not com communicate or connect. Right. You know, J Jamaicans vis-a-vis -vis Africans, Africans vis-a-vis -vis African Americans, um, Black British versus... Uh, I also, because that's my experience, I find it non-threatening to be open about these tensions. Mm -hmm. And I find it troubling that so many people insist on keeping them quiet and fragile. I don't think we're fragile. I think we're able to have these conversations and still move forward cross-culturally. In right. fact, I believe we have to have those conversations, not maintaining those myths. Right, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that. Um, I, I share that goal and particularly in terms of sort of showing the intimate ways in which sort of um, racism shows up within black communities um, and, and not just in relationship to white people or white spaces, but how we're all sort of navigating these stories. Like, for example, the story of my family with a Ghanaian, a dark, a dark skinned Ghanaian father moving to Ethiopia with two lighter skinned daughters and the confusion that that created, um, you know, among Ethiopian people and many of the Ethiopians that we encountered at that time sort of didn't necessarily even think of themselves as black, but they, they also saw me as sort of more kindred to them, but my father was not. But to me, he was my father. And so that was very confusing as a child. You know, what, what does this mean? How I'm being seen? And then, you know, going to boarding school in England um, and being one of few black students in a, in a white board, a very white boarding school and sort of aligning myself with white people because I was, a, I was aware of the way that the racial arrangement and, and my white adjacency would, would give me privileges. And I knew what I was doing. I was a child, but I was aware of that arrangement. And I, I felt shame about what I was doing. And I think it's important to acknowledge those complexities and the ways that we all participate. Um, because, you know, the, the, for me, sort of recognizing that sort of ugliness and anti internalized anti-Blackness in myself and working to undo it has to be part of my work. Right, um, right. And so, you know, that, that was another, you know, element of the story that I told. And in the same way, you know, the, 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 um, the tension between the Tanzanian family and my uh, father's Ghanaian family, that is also engaging with, you know, anti-Black stories um, as well. And so, you know, there is a lot of complexity there. And I think as Black peoples, we have our own conversations that we need to have, you know, outside of white, whiteness and white supremacy, we have our own conversations that we need to have um, in order to undo, we have to undo, we can't move anything in the world that we won't move in ourselves. Right. And so that, that was really important to me. Right. No worries. Thank you so much, Nadia. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nadia. I was just, I'm thinking, coming out of a Pan-African context that failed, but also stayed alive and was also in inspirational to so many people. I discovered when I got to the United States after growing up in Jamaica during the Rastafarian movement, where everyone celebrated Africa, but didn't actually like Africans, <laughs> Africa was a symbol, the African people were a different thing entirely. Then coming to the United States and becoming a teenager in the early 20s when it was Afrocentric hip hop, <laughs> right? And at the same time, hostility to black immigrants it just seemed to me that the Pan-African dream did in fact imply in the early part of the 20th century, work. <laughs> it implied that people had to work at it. Right. I think that what's happened since then is people just assume that we should just take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And I think that what Nadia and I are talking about, again, to assume this sort of kinship here is that we can't just assume solidarity, we gotta work for it. <laughs> And one of the ways we work for it is by handling some of these unpleasant things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. It looks like the, your, your, your answers responds to, um, or respond to the, the last question that has been asked. And, and Jane and Sarah, I wish we had like a whole hour because this has been such a delicious panel. And next time, just let's have an ask lot. So it's time for us to wrap things up. Thanks, Louise and Nadia, and to everyone who is watching. Please consider buying your featured books from your local independent bookseller 
or using the link provided. You can also check out other events in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book at vabook.org. Without further ado, I'd like to really thank you so very much for this pleasant conversation. And I'm hoping that in the foreseeable future, we'll would be able to meet and have a chinwag in person. This, that has to happen. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. This is lovely. Right.